Hi everyone, and welcome to Flat Impacts Wolf and Machine Series for Professional Advisors, where today we are discussing old and new forms of giving. My name is Sophie Sahanik, and I'm the Director of Membership and Development here at Flat Impact. If you're a regular viewer, you will know by now that this series is carefully curated with the aim to support our audience as you navigate the Flat Impact investment space and is a core part of our service offering for members. If you'd like to know more about our other services and the benefit of membership for you and your firm, then please do get in touch with me directly. As we keep these discussions strictly to 30 minutes, we, they do go really quickly, um, but we do encourage audience interaction. So please use the chat to introduce yourselves and have your say and pose any questions you might have to our panel. Please make sure to select panel and all attendees or everyone um, when posting in the chat so that we can, all can see. It's now time to welcome and thank our chair for this topic, Nancy Bixon, who's the founder and managing director of Chapel and York. And joining Nancy, we welcome Michelle Fugel Gartner, philanthropy advisor at MFG Change, and Kath Dovey, who's the co-founder of the Beacon Collaborative. Thank you all for joining us today, and I'll now hand over to Nancy to make a start. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Sophia, and thank you, Philanthropy Impact, for asking me and for creating this uh, really interesting series, which has been so uh, so well received and looked at so many um, amazing different parts of philanthropy. What we're sort of talking about today is um, looking at all the new forms of giving, although we're probably going to look more at the new forms than the old. Um, the um, it's it's obviously an area which. Um, has changed dramatically over the last um, numbers of years. Um, I was reminded of that particularly, I was in Crete last month and the, there was a, um, an earthquake and um, 100,000 people lost their homes. And so in the, um, in the square, in the village we were in, um, they were collecting um, food and money and um, clothes and things for the people that, uh, that needed them. And I was sort of thinking when we were looking at this, that that's the old form of giving. Um, so what else would we be talking to people who are interested in helping in that particular case or other cases um, in terms of a broader sense of, of what people want to do and how they want to do it? Um, so Chapel in York, we're very, we've been doing this for about 25 years. We, um, we've got um, seven uh, foundations around the world and we have seen, so that's for charities to fundraise and for donors to give through. We're seeing some incredibly interesting um, ways of, in which companies particularly um, have been looking at how they can get their employees involved in things. So that's been our brand new thing that we're starting to see is a lot of interest in that. Um, so let me ask you, Michelle, and then Kath, what, is, what are you seeing? What are the current giving trends that's going on in your world? Sure, thanks so much, Nancy. Um, just a bit of background. So I am a philanthropic advisor. I also am doing my PhD on family foundations and the people who give money away inside family foundations. And I also teach nonprofit management. And so I say that to say share that I try to see uh, giving from quite a few perspectives. Um, I would say in terms of the past year, it's undeniable to say that COVID has had an impact and will continue having an impact. And we are unclear about what that impact might look like. Um, I think in the example that you've given, you know, we sought last year to really look at immediate needs. So a lot of the giving was following you know, immediate relief um, with COVID. And I think now it's starting to look like, what is this going to look like long term? And how are people going to feel like they are giving back and creating impact in the long term? Just quickly to add on to your example, we had a local community group, sort of a mutual aid group, um, who were providing that type of traditional giving last year and now have spun off and formed a, a, a small little investment fund. So it's actually to show the connection between what might look old and how it is becoming new as well. Um, I think part of this is connected to um, the idea of a total portfolio impact. So you mentioned corporations. I think it's a matter of having the opportunity to examine the roles in the, that we all hold in our lives. We might be an investor, we might be a donor, we might be a volunteer, uh, we sit on a board. So what are the, the values that we're bringing into those roles? And, and how are we actualizing on those values? What tools are we using in each of those scenarios? And, and at the more I see, those tools are becoming blended. So what might have been just the remit of investments 
um, is now becoming closer into, you know, what do donors feel like they can do across the board and what do corporations feel like they can do. Um, so I feel like that is, it is becoming more of a blend of all the tools and a blend by different people who can access them and how they put them together to use them. Um, I suppose just in terms of a few final trends, I would say certainly there's trends on and huge issues around social justice, around climate change, and certainly methodologies of participatory giving. So trying to connect with beneficiaries to provide them space to tell them, to tell donors how to give. Uh, so in the um, dismantling power structures and decolonization. Um, so those are all very big topics, but those are a few, a few that I'm seeing. Thank you, Michelle. Um, we'll, I want to come back to a couple of those things that you've mentioned. So let me let me bring Kath into the conversation, and then we'll come back to them. Kath, thank you welcome. so much. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, certainly seeing similar trends in my perspective from Beacon Collaborative, we focus on trying to increase the levels of high net worth giving in the UK. So maybe a slightly narrower focus. Um, but one of the things that we do um, is to try and uh, support the development of the infrastructure for giving um, and in order to do that we look at levels of giving so we do a quarterly survey of high net worths to try and understand what the giving trends have been and certainly from the numbers that we have seen over the last 18 months um, absolutely what you're saying uh, Michelle and Nancy you know there was a really big uplift in giving at the height of the crisis through both of the the big sort of waves um, really driven by those who've got more than five million in investable assets what's been really Really interesting in the last three months has been looking at the wider high net worth population and again particularly those with more than five million are sustaining levels of giving that they were not expecting to sustain. So what we're seeing in this is that there were some very big gifts from um, philanthropists who are reasonably well established in their practice. That was to existing organizations where they had a relationship and to the relief effort. That's starting to dial down. And what's coming forward now are those who really started giving through COVID and are almost certainly looking for the support to take the next step in their giving practice. So this to me is very much about how do we engage and how do we en enable that wider group of people who've been en engaged through, through the COVID um, uh, era. And I think linked to that, we're also seeing uh, this idea of uh, enhanced corporate giving or enhanced um, total portfolio impact. As business owners realise they are both high net worth and business owners, what more can they do? I think it's important to remember that when people first uh, engage in the act of giving, they may not have all of the the knowledge and, and the expertise and the experience to perhaps bring in some of these more refined and complex elements if we're going to talk about decolonization if we're going to talk about power dynamics if we're going to talk about participation they may not have that in year one that's something that's very much up to us to engage them in and bring them into that practice over time so i think we've got two groups here really that we're working with the experienced the big givers who may be dialing down on the big gifts but will want to maintain some of the practices that were developed through covid and those who are coming in for the first time and how can we make sure that we enable them and accelerate their growth into the kinds of philanthropy we would like to see. That's very interesting because in some respects, although you're both very aligned in terms of, of what you're talking about with portfolio growth, etc., cetera, um, I, I felt that Michelle, you were talking a little bit more about almost what people's interests were as opposed to the mechanisms for getting um, funds and getting, and su getting support. Um, were you seeing that the mechanisms, the kinds of things that we do in terms of advisors, in terms of how they give, um, in terms of the types of giving and the types of involvement, did you see a different, have you seen a difference in the last 18 months, um, you know, in your practice? And then I think have the same question as well. In other words, has, has this, has there been a shift in terms of direct giving or is it still that people are looking for a range of opportunities in which they can engage with the, um, you know, the issues that they're most interested in supporting. Michelle, do you want to start with that? Sure. I mean, it's a really big question. Um, and I think, Kathy, you have a nice breakdown of sort of inexperienced givers or new givers um, and ones who might have been doing it for a while. I mean, I, I think to answer the question, 
I think the best way would to, to talk about um, there is data that says individuals still are more likely to give cash. So when we think about giving, it's still more likely to come in forms of cash donations, things that people can tangibly do. I think that anytime you see a, an emergency, this can be part of the opportunity to get involved right away, right in your immediate community. I mean, think about it, we couldn't leave our communities. So we were hands on there. And I think that kind of goes in the face of these very exciting new ways of giving that might be more investment focused. I don't think we, necessarily started there um, in 2020. I think a lot of people were, you know, had the challenges of how do we get things to people? So how do we deliver things to people? How do we, you know, how do we understand what people are needing? And that's almost very traditional in a way. Um, I would say though, with that is, again, just different ways of thinking about how that might happen. So even thinking about you could use online tech online technologies to make those delivery connections, whereas you wouldn't have been able to do that more traditionally. And I think we're starting to see this blending of tools together um, over the, you know, over the past year. And certainly as we think about the future of how do we support community and society coming out of COVID, what are those, what are those tools and how do we blend them together? So I think, I think that's what I'm seeing. I think there's quite a bit of innovation, even if it might look a bit more traditional, but there's also a lot of innovation in very new spaces. But again, that's, that ha that's very, those are tall orders sometimes for people who are just starting to want to give and who might've just started testing their giving practice during COVID. So they want to know, how can I give? How can I give back? How do I do this over time? You know, I've been volunteering for 18 months. How do I keep volunteering? So they will be asking these questions about how this practice, these practices can continue in their life. And, and, um, I think, you know, to Kath's point, there's got to be multiple points of support and advice for givers of all types and how to take these next steps. Thank you. That's, that's such an important point about where we're going with this. Kath, what have your figures and your research shown in terms of how people have looked at and where, where this, this whole philanthropy area is going? I, I'm likely to just reinforce what Michelle has said, you know, people who were already giving, who already had some experience, didn't stop giving to the things they cared about. In fact, if anything, they recognised that they needed those gifts quickly, they needed them in unrestricted form, and they needed the money to keep coming through the crisis. That didn't preclude them from also giving to emergency responses, and there were a lot of emergency responses that set up and were phenomenal at, at, at raising funds. So if there are these connection points, if there are these access points, you know, people do give to them. New givers give to them. If the, if the, if the nexus is immediately there, that they can, you know, that they know that their cash is going where it needs to go and it's needed quickly. The real challenge is to embed that because what happens when those emergency funds switch off? Do people just then retreat? You know, if we learned one thing from it, it was where um, where appeals are well publicised, they they attract a lot of attention and a lot of money. Now those appeals have disappeared. Um, you know, what is going to be the thing that engages those people who recognize through the crisis that money needed to go into these causes? The problems have not gone away. In many ways, we're just at the start of the long haul back. So it's absolutely imperative that we continue to think creatively about how we engage them, because the appeals, you know, the emergency relief phase is almost over. So this is absolutely now about, you know, really engaging those people for the long term. Um, in terms of um, innovations, I mean, in addition to the appeals, you know, we saw large amounts of money going into the donor advised fund community, um, collective funds, individual funds, huge amounts of innovation happening in that space. Lots of money coming in, lots of grant money going out. Um, so that's experienced donors or it's donors who have thought about giving, have got a, a wealth advisor and that wealth advisor has said, if you really want to put that much money aside, you know, you need to talk to these people because they will help you. They'll help you with the administration. They'll help this work really smoothly for you. Um, so we've seen innovation happening there as well. Um, it's, it's all across the board. The opportunity now is to embed those behaviours. So we have a question, which was going to be my question anyway, um, which is wonderful, which is um, to start with you, Kath, um, whether you're seeing any common forms or types of giving 
um, with new upcoming young philanthropists or new or, or just new people to philanthropy themselves. You know, we've there's been such a menu of ways that people can support things. What are you? Where are you seeing new things, or are you seeing, you know, some things that are really coming to the fore? I'm absolutely passionate about the power of networks. You know, networks are a place where you access knowledge, like-minded people, you get ideas, you find opportunities. This was already starting before COVID, but the emergence of networks in the UK in different forms. So, you know, things like the Environmental Funders Network or through Beacon's work, New Philanthropy for Arts and Culture, or in the women and girls sector, Impact 100, you know, um, uh, um, Impatience Earth, brilliant new concept that's been set up offering pro bono advice to people who want to get involved in climate change. You know, these are forming networks of people who are trying to find their way onto this donor journey. And they're coming at it from the donor perspective. They provide, if you will, that safe space for donors to come together with more experienced donors or with experts in the field to learn you know, what good looks like and so that they can put that into practice themselves. I think networks are hugely, um, you know, motivating and powerful. And in the UK, we're really just at the start of seeing that whole movement take off. Super. Thank you. Michelle, do you want to add um, into that conversation? Yeah, I feel like Kath and I are just agreeing with everything today. It's great. Um, no, I, I think there's uh, additional research um, looking at women givers. And um, as we're hearing, women are having more influence over giving. We have situations where they're um, more single um, head of household, higher earners. And then you start to see with millennial givers, they are uh, looking more into peer group opportunities, such as giving circles, such as networks, as a way to um, help further them along and, and participate in different ways. I mean, as Kath mentioned, there's issue area giving, such as environmental funders or human rights. But there's also styles of giving. So you might be giving through a DAP. You might be exploring what blended uh, finance might look like. You might be providing loans. Um, there's some really interesting opportunities. Uh, it would almost seem it looks on the for-profit side that blend philanthropy and investment in women owned companies. So I think all of these networks are really great opportunities for people to get involved on their donor journey, journey um, and to be learning about it. Um, I think in terms of new, new ways of giving, I mean, technology has a huge role to play in how funds are channeled from one place to another. Um, I think there's and it's interesting in the UK, I suppose this reflects my US and Canada perspective a bit more, but you have a lot of opportunities for individual giving. So whereas we're very used to giving to a charity, um, individual giving through platforms such as Just Giving, helping people out with their health insurance costs. Um, and this is a very different style of giving, but one that connects and resonates for many people who are looking to make a personal immediate impact. So they're not going to be getting a tax benefit for it, quite likely, but they are going to be feeling an immediate impact of helping an individual. I think that's something to keep our eye on, both sort of in North America, but also in other countries where uh, the charitable sector might not be as deep. Um, I think we're probably also seeing more interest, especially through the rise of ESG, um, talking about how these principles of sustainability and of um, caring for the long term can be put into our um, in our investments, but also how those investments also support our philanthropic donations. I mean, the examples are clear. If you're, you know, a cancer, you're, you're wanting to donate to cancer research. Are you also investing in tobacco? You know, it's a very common one we've heard. We have those examples now around oil. So I think this alignment of values is a really interesting place that people um, it's not just one new tool, but many new tools that they can use to align around their values. I think that's, I think that's what's new. As, as an advisor, Michelle, what would you, if, if someone was coming into your office and wanted to talk to you about philanthropy, what would be the first things that you'd want to, um, to be talking to them about in the first half an hour of that conversation, besides whether they can afford you or not? I just want to know what they care about. I, I tend to take the perspective that um, these are private resources used for public purposes. So let's really understand 
why you're here in my office talking about philanthropy, what your motivations are, um, what your experience with giving has been, mm -hmm. what your perceptions and assumptions are about giving. Um, I'm really interested in the person. It, it makes it, I suppose, not a very efficient way to do it because it is sort of one by one. It's very bespoke. But I think that um, having the perspective I do on people starting this journey at so many different places, it's very difficult to standardize um, you know, this is step one, step two, step three. So I am really interested as well. It gives me a sense of what strategies would be most appropriate for those people. Um, you know, people will be very interested in strategic philanthropy. Other people won't. They want to give how, you know, what speaks to them immediately, maybe um, very heartfelt. These are all fine. And so as an advisor, it's an opportunity to really understand where they're coming from. And, and Kath, what, 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 do you, what, what do you want to talk, talk about with people besides just their, you know, the initial giving interests? Well, generally, we don't give advice to end donors. So we work very much with the, the infrastructure organizations that are already in play. Um, but I do think that there is a critical role for wealth advisors. You know, what does a wealth advisor do in this space? What they do is they help donors, new donors or experienced donors, make better decisions. So really what an advisor is about is understanding the issues and even some of those more complex issues that we've touched on. You know, a wealth advisor needs to understand the language of decolonization and power dynamics and, and you know, the inequalities that have been you know, embedded in our society for, for, as, long, for as long as they, you know, there's, they've been there. And, and Michelle makes a really good point. You know, when a philanthropist starts giving, they are moving private resources into the public sphere. And that comes with responsibility. So advisors need to understand that and they need to be able to help them learn, you know, all of these steps so that they recognize this journey that they're taking from the private into the public. They also can provide the structures. Um, you know, there's an opportunity for advisors to make giving as effective as possible. Um, obviously, we have some standard structures here in the UK, but I think there's huge potential for innovation around structures. And I know, Nancy, you do a lot of this at Chapel in York. You know, we, we are in the foothills of innovation for moving money yeah. from A to B. And then the, the third area, I would say, is the one I've already mentioned, which is forming those networks. You know, wealth advisors have the relationships, obviously in another context, but they also have that opportunity to provide that safe space for wealthy people to come together and talk about their giving um whether that's signposting them to, to a network that's already out there or whether that's doing something in-house um, but creating those networks will give donors the confidence to move from step a to step b and hopefully all the way to the end step z um, so i think there really is an incredibly powerful role for advisors and, and as with all of these things um we're all on a learning journey as to how to deliver that well, we're certainly also seeing um the sort of giving circle model growing um, rapidly with, with companies that are embedding philanthropy in their business model. So that particularly those that have a group of people coming together to do something that that's part of what they're doing is looking at how they're making money, but also how they're giving it away. So I suppose um, I'm looking at time. Um, what would you, qu rather quickly, I suppose, what would you suggest is the greatest challenge for philanthropy um, that we're going to address in the next um, short term and possibly long term. Mm. Kath? I think in the short term, the challenge we're going to have to address is the speed with which we, things have developed over the last 18 months. Trusts and foundations have moved at lightning speed to respond to donors, to change the way that they do things, to really forensically examine their own practice and to develop it. And I think individual philanthropists, if they're not well supported, are a long way behind that and uh, run quite a lot of risks actually in terms of a form of philanthropy that may not be acceptable in the next 18 months. So I think there's a massive learning curve that individual philanthropists are gonna need to get onto to be at the same level of, uh, of transition that we've seen happening in the professionalized and professional trust and foundation space. I think that really is an immediate risk. I think the opportunity, as I said right at the beginning, is that we've got a lot more individuals who've engaged in giving over the last 18 months. And it would be a real shame and it would be a, such a wasted opportunity if we didn't figure out how to engage them over the next, you know, six months to 18 months. Would you say that's across the board age, age um, as well? 
in, in terms of the new philanthropists that they've both been young people coming into to it, but also people obviously that have a greater age? Absolutely. But I think there's a really big difference in attitude between the youngest, younger and the elder donors. And I think just putting this very sort of candidly and straightforwardly, you know, older donors have had more experience to have had bad experiences. So they may have given through the COVID crisis, but if they don't get an immediate follow up, then they will you know, retreat and disappear and say charities are just as bad as they've always been. Whereas I think younger donors who might have a little bit more of a lead time before they start to get um, poss possibly disillusioned by the kinds of relationships and services that they that they receive. So I think um, from a, a fundraiser's point of view, I'd be focusing on both ends of the spectrum, but just making sure that um, the donor experience that's delivered, particularly to those older, older generation donors is, you know, really supportive and, and really values what they bring to the relationship as well as valuing their money. Thank you. Michelle, um, if you could answer, sort of looking at the same thing, but also maybe bringing in some of your North American experience, because obviously the whole sense of charity um, is very different in North America. And um, whether that relationship between charities and donors um, in, in the States and Canada, um, whether that is going to, you know, whether that informs differently from what you've seen in the UK in terms of um, challenges going forwards? Sure. Um, I mean, there are three different jurisdictions, and um, I think that, well, I'll take it from a nonprofit management point of view. Um, fundraising, many, many canceled fundraising events, and uh, recruitment and retention of volunteers have been two really big challenges for charities. I mean, um, across North America, I'd say here in the UK as well. So when we start thinking about what fundraisers, what we hope that they can start doing, and I agree wholeheartedly with Kath about this relationship development, um, relationship development being the primary task of a fundraiser, um, as opposed to sort of maybe short term annual campaigns, it would be amazing if every younger donor could be relationship, have a relationship that could develop in over over the course of their lifetime. But unfortunately, that's not the case with some of the pressures of charitable fundraising. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is going to be public trust, public trust in what philanthropy has the legitimacy to do and what donors have the legitimacy to do with their private resources. Um, I think the challenge will look like regulation and what types of regulation become proposed both here in the UK but also in North America and whether that regulation is the right type of tool to satisfy public trust or, or if it makes it even more challenging. Um, so I'm very optimistic that there will be many both new and old tools for different donors to participate in. But I do think, like Kath said, there's going to be potential issues with donors catching up in terms of, you know, having public trust around their giving. Thank you. John, do you Hi, want Nancy. to come in now? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, that was brilliant, Michelle, Nancy, and Kath. Thank you very much. Um, there's some really interesting positive things going on in addition to what you're saying. A number of major wealth advisory firms have now started to build in to their day-to-day -day service offering where every advisor has to talk to their clients about um, their donor journey, their social investment journey, tying it into impact and ESG investing. The other is the constant growth of social investment. Uh, which is another way of expressing your uh, philanthropy, but in a different way. So um, we've only got a, a short time left. So can we have 30 seconds of final words of wisdom and we'll start with Michelle. <laughs> Thanks. I would just say, I think that the opportunity um, immediately for advisors is to work with their donors on understanding the value sets, understanding the roles, the spectrum of roles that people hold, and really ask using that as a framework to understand what they're willing to do with their private resources. And maybe there are blended opportunities, giving through their corporations, different investments as donations, just different, different blends and understanding those roles will be the foundation of making those um, suggestions. Thank you, Michelle. Kath, over to you. So thinking from the advisor's perspective, if I was sitting in an advisor's chair, what would I be asking myself? I'd be asking myself, what do I need to do today to help my clients make better decisions about their philanthropy and social investment? What do I need to know? 
and and how can I support what tools do I need and how can I support uh, the clients that ask me for that for my opinion on that how can I support them to take those next steps it's interesting because uh, we're seeing more and more how clients really want to talk about their values and live their values, not just through philanthropy, but also through their investment. Nancy, I'm going to give you the final word and thank you very much for doing a brilliant job sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking me. I think that the, from our standpoint, the world has been a much smaller place and will continue to be so. And that means that more people will reach out to the rest of the world um, rather than as well as to their local communities. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. Sophia, over to you. Hi. It's such a challenge sitting here, not being allowed to get involved in any of these conversations, but I love that one. Thank you very much. Um, next week, we are back and we will be looking and exploring the barriers to achieving the UN SDGs and the role that philanthropy and impact investing can, can play in overcoming these barriers and challenges. So hopefully that will be a really great one too. Um, have a good week, everybody. Thanks so much for your time. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.